Welcome everybody to our yet unnamed podcast, uh, which will be published at undetermined intervals, if that can be as vague as possible. Um, Steve, how are you? <laughs> hey, I'm doing great, Randy. It's a uh, sunny day in LA after this incredible amount of uh, rain we've been having. And so I'm in a happy mood today, man. I am concerned about California because it feels <laughs> like God himself is trying to kill all of you. It's either too hot or you have no water, or you have too much water. What's the case today? It's uh, about between too much and quite not quite enough. And our it's so normally um, uh, dry this time of year, typically, that the sprinkler system was going off uh, in the middle of the rainstorm. We had to <laughs> make a little adjustment. But uh, it tells you, you know, kind of where we are. It was snowing the other day, and we have citrus in our yard that is uh, ready to be harvested and yet in the middle of snowstorms in Southern California. What a weird world we're in. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, uh, I am back in Kansas, where you hail from, where nothing ever happens. Yeah. So it's just fine. It's just normal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Everything's normal here. Um, you and I met uh, about 100 years ago. Um, we both served Lewis and Clark on the expedition and made ourselves friends. No, I think we met like, I, I tried to put math to this, about 1996. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's about exactly right. Yeah. About, about 96. And uh, you guys were still meeting at the Cincinnati Vineyard in the old building. I cannot remember the name of the street. What was that on? Uh, Crescentville. Crescentville, the Crescentville building. Crescentville. And I think at the time you were doing seven or eight services. And I was visiting from out of right. town. And I had to meet you because I had just never seen church like this before. It was just so life-giving oh. to me. And so I chased you down in the tunnel, like down in the basement of the church and caught you with no grid yeah. for how busy someone is when they have eight services. I just figured, oh, he'll have time for me. And um, <laughs> you were so kind. You actually did make time for me. And you and Jim Cochran prayed for me down there. And uh, I remember, really? oh. yeah, I remember uh, you just kept saying, you're really with the Assemblies of God? Because that seemed like the strangest <laughs> thing about me at the time. And maybe it was. I, I often thought maybe you had a premonition that, well, that's not going to last. But um, that's when I met you. Oh, and then we moved to Cincinnati maybe a year later, maybe not quite that long. And uh, uh -huh. uh, you and I kind of struck up a friendship and have uh, right. spent a lot of years um, just talking and drinking a lot of coffee and, and scheming and that sort of thing. Um, there's so much that we, we can talk about. And as we, we talked about earlier, you know, one of the things that you and I bring, which is a bit unique, is just a different perspective. We don't really know that much more than anybody else. But uh, sometimes Absolutely. we look at things a little differently than they do. And there's so much, I was making notes that I would love to talk about, we'll probably have to do in subsequent conversations. I'd love to talk with you about um, uh, all that's gone on at Asbury over the past couple of weeks and yeah. the, the revival culture and, and, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of that, because there's all of that. Um, I'd love to talk church planting theories. I'd like to talk about, man, where, where did the seeker sensitive model go off the rails? Cause there was a lot of good there. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, nobody is using that language and has it now for years. But today, right. uh, the more, more pertinent thing today is I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, the movie, the Jesus revolution and mm -hmm. Lonnie Frisbee. Now I took a poll on Instagram of what you and I should talk about. And, uh, 40% of the people thought you and I should just sing the hits. That's what we should do today. <laughs> Um, which which uh, Motown or uh, you know they didn't Capital specify, but and I think we can only disappoint them. So we're okay. not we're not gonna we're not gonna get into that. Although I know your repertoire is deep, um, but we do want to talk <laughs> about the Jesus Revolution and Lonnie Frisbee. Everybody in their brother on YouTube is commenting on this uh, and talking okay. about it. Lots of interviews. Um, I actually yeah. saw a reaction video to another interview. It's like one YouTuber interviews another guy. Now a third guy is videoing his reaction. I'm like, we, that is so far removed. <laughs> I don't think we need that. But you have a bit of a unique insight because um, you were there for a part of that. Season. Right. Uh, exactly. Give us a little context for how you found yourself there. I know you are a proud Kansan, uh, but <laughs> you ended up in Los Angeles. What got you there and what was the ramp up to that? Yeah, uh, the quick uh, bingo jumping around on the scorecard. Uh, raised in Kansas, uh, uh, my dad died uh, at a young age. My mom's an anesthetist, moved to Arizona, uh, worked in a hospital there as an anesthetist. I got a scholarship to go to Norway for a year out of high school and went there as a, an exchange student. And uh, really during that year of uh, four months of absolute darkness in northern Norway, <laughs> 
October to February. I mean, that'll get anybody kind of nuts. But but I I've got to, I thought you know I'm just going to read while I'm here if I can do nothing real productive uh, in terms of outdoor activities, <laughs> and so. Uh, began to read the New Testament, uh, long story short, got to Romans 8, came to Christ, personal faith, I know, I kind of use that word a lot, uh, came to personal faith of really knowing Christ, and uh, felt that an inca- a calling really to do evangelism, but almost immediately, Randy, this is interesting, somebody gave me a book in Norwegian about what was happening in Southern California with the Jesus Movement, and this wow. is uh, toward the tail end of the whole thing right. in the uh, early early to mid-70s, but um the cool thing was it was it was like this girl comes up I barely had met. She goes, I feel like God told me to give you this book. It was a translation of another book called Jesus People in Norwegian, like I said. And I knew I read enough to get the gist of it. And uh, amazingly, these picture after picture after picture uh, were the people that I ended up later on becoming friends with. <laughs> wow. You know, Lonnie, uh, the guy who started the vineyard initially was Ken Gullickson, who was uh, Chuck Smith's first higher and his uh, launch into a Calvary world. And, and so, uh, you know, fascinating um, out of the, uh, I'd finished college was going to get into uh, foreign missions. Janie and I had uh, felt led to pray for and consider going to uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. And uh, we thought, has anybody ever heard of that place? Well, it's in the news constantly for a long yeah. time anyway, but uh, ended up at the last minute saying, we're not going to do that. We're going to we felt like the Lord spoke to us, go to L.A., ask Ken Gullickson if he'll let you be an intern. And wow. so we uh, vacated Kansas and uh, where I'd finished college and went out there, met with Ken. He hired me on the spot as an intern, uh, spent a couple of years there doing that and also teaching fourth grade, which has been essential in ministry. <laughs> Settle down, keep your hands to yourself. And are you behaving? You know, those are the three big questions that we passed out to ask. That's, that's, that's an entire series right there. I'm I'm good to yeah. go to preach for the next couple of weeks. So, like, what year would this have been that you went out to Gullickson? That would have been uh, 80. 80, right, okay. Right at the middle of 80, right after the whole Lonnie Frisbee thing happened at the vineyard, at John Wimber's Vineyard. Yeah, right. That now, happened on Mother's Day. We were there. Yeah, go ahead. I want to, I want to talk about that a little bit, because the movie is kind of set earlier than that. Is that right? Yes, yes. I think it was set when Lonnie first showed up right. at Chuck's house. And uh, a little old lady in that little Bible study at Chuck's house, uh, Chuck was at a point where he said, I'm about ready to give up every, give up the ghost in terms of ministry. Because he, in his own words, he felt like he was manipulating people. He had gotten to the point of, I'll do this and that'll happen and so forth and so on. And it's a form of, if you will, at best, uh, a tool, but at worst, a manipulation. Yeah. And and so Chuck said, I'm just going to maybe pull the plug. He did carpentry for a, for a time. And this little old lady shows the Bible said, she goes, I have a word from the Lord. And she's kind of quivering her voice and says, you know, one of these days, not too long from now, this little Bible studies will will uh, spawn a movement around the world. I'm getting chills here. Wow. <laughs> uh, that uh, will change the, the face of the church. Uh, it'll be young people and the ones that nobody else wants. I find that fascinating. The ones that nobody else wants. And it'll it'll be big and fantastic. Anyway, Chuck said he heard it and he thought it was like Sarah at the tent when the angel said, a year from now, you're going to have a baby. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, Sarah laughing at the tent. And he said, I was just like that. I, I began to just be a scoff at the whole idea. It was so crazy because I was so burned out. And and right then, about that time within, as I understood, I certainly was before my time, uh, as I have heard it told uh, that Lonnie showed up within a week or two. That yeah. A guy in the Bible study had been hitchhiking, picked up a hitchhiker, Lonnie. And uh, so I call him the original hippie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So time goes by. The movie takes uh-huh. place. You show up about 1980, and by this time, Wimber is got Anaheim going, right. correct? And right. he he invites Lonnie to speak. Lonnie mm-hmm. has been in the area now for a while, and he's kind of a known quantity. Uh, not by John. John knew nothing about Lonnie, and he had not heard any of the stories about Lonnie. So this uh, skinny. This was before not the days of social person. media when things happened and we did not know it within 12 seconds. No, that, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and even if we could have, I'm not sure John would have uh, been drawn to a guy like Lonnie, who's this, you know, he's basically a, uh, a fairly feral person. <laughs> and uh, 
Yep. Yeah, we have this is too strong a word, maybe, but he, he's a little bit, uh, he's an iconoclast. How's that? He doesn't really fit very well. Right. And so he asked John a number of times over a few weeks, uh, can I speak at the at the Sunday night or something? And, you know, John just kept saying, not, you're not going to speak. Who are you, by the way? Blah, blah, blah. And he, he thought, Mother's Eve, there's only a few people at church. John did church every Sunday night. In his words, because people give money on Sunday nights. <laughs> I kind of like that, uh, and uh, and he so he did Sunday night on on Mother's Day. It's kind of like doing you know a, a Sunday night when the Beatles are playing on uh, Ed Solomon show or something. You know, uh, you know nobody's gonna want to be there. And so anyway, what happens is uh, he gives him the mic. He says, "We have about ten minutes left, fifteen minutes." He says, "Lonnie, go ahead." And Lonnie just spoke for a little bit. And uh, again, I was not there, but I know a number who were there. They said it sounded like. A, uh, a folding chair uh, explosion happened. Lonnie got up and said, repent, you know, begin to honor the Holy Spirit. And he prayed that the original prayer that has become famous, come Holy Spirit. Yeah. And in his words, uh, God told me to pray that prayer. And he he's commented to me uh, a time or two. He said, you know, you can't just make up a prayer. You have to, when you get the prayer from God, but wow. boom, something happens. And uh, when he prayed it, people began to repent. They they jumped over. And John said to me later that it was embarrassing because the, <laughs> they were there till after midnight. They should have been out by like nine o'clock or something. And the, the poor janitor kept flipping the lights on and off. The problem was nobody could move. Not, well, not everybody could, was paralyzed, but a lot of people were so being touched by the spirit that there was kind of like a, he called it a, a pile of logwood, you know, on top of each other, people just like that. And uh, they now finally for, got out of there, but but one guy shook for two days, he said. <laughs> now, for a lot of us, bed. for a lot of us, our first exposure to the vineyard was when we heard about things going on in Toronto. And yeah, so we I look agree. at, there's a lot of the outside world looks at the vineyard through the Toronto lens, which is mm -hmm. not the original context for the vineyard. John was pretty understated, wasn't he? Oh, boy. Uh, John uh, and well, I would say Lonnie was not real flamboyant. Uh, I, I've seen him operate a number of times where I just thought it was so natural and, and so forth. But, but John certainly modeled that. Uh, maybe he learned it from Lonnie a bit. I'm not sure. But uh, when John would uh, pray for people, et cetera, et cetera, it's very, very low key. You, you almost wondered, was that the prayer? <laughs> are we done? And, Is it over? Yeah, are we done? Yes. And uh, and so very often, of course, John would get a a prayer he honored he valued that if i don't get a prayer from god nothing's going to happen anyway why wow. why try to fake it and so he would share you know accordingly but uh you know amazingly uh once we began to to tap into that whole line of thinking it really does change the way we approach the christian life well it's, i think it it changes the way we approach the christian life and i think it changes the way we um minister within the gifts of the holy spirit Absolutely. Yes. You know, one thing that I'll be honest, that really drew me to the Cincinnati Vineyard and and to you and unknowingly to John and, and those things who I never met, but just stylistically was uh, the lack of of any pretense or anything that looked like manipulation. It's, yeah. it's either God shows up or he doesn't. Either mm -hmm. way, he loves us and we go home. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not going to do anything to make something happen, which sounds a little bit like what Chuck Smith was talking about. There is a fine line between uh, leading a meeting and manipulation. Yes. Yes, I completely agree. Sometimes it's not very fine. Yeah, not true. <laughs> I'm long... trying to be kind. Yeah. <laughs> You're a nice guy, Randy. I am. Uh, yeah. But, you know, John's whole beginning was he went to a retreat at a famous center in L.A. or he called Forest Home. You may, many have heard of it if they've not been there. And uh, he was there speaking uh, in behalf of a friend of his who's a pastor. And she said, he said, the lady has a word from you for you from the Lord. And John was completely skeptical. He, he mocked the idea of a word from the Lord at that point. Wow. And he went over and he, he calls it. She was overweight. I was overweight. We waddled off to the side, he called it. And uh, she began to cry. And she cried. And then she started like howling, practically crying, intensely crying. And he said he stood there a few feet away looking at his watch going, what in the world? I had to speak in about five minutes. So he finally says, lady, if you have something for me, um, would you just tell me now? Because I got to speak. Well, she looks up with, you know, mascara down her cheek and red eyes, et cetera. And she goes, that was the word, the weeping. And John said, if you had shot me in the chest with the bazooka, I would not have been more surprised. He goes, I 
I, I again, you know, maybe I'm a sissy in my old age, but I, I get chills when I tell that story yeah. as well, because it, it, it so nails, I think, where so much of what God has done went through John, through uh, so many and so much in Vineyard World, I think, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you get there, Lonnie is, this is post Mother's Day, Lonnie's kind of in the swirl. How's he connecting to John? What's going on? Yeah, um, Janie, my wife, and I showed up at a little um, impromptu retreat that happened over a couple of days in, in Anaheim there at the their offices. And uh, uh, Lonnie was there. There was about a dozen people all together. Uh, they set up the uh, long tables you would see, folding tables in many places. And the, all the interns that Ken had gathered together and, uh, and, and a few that John had as well. And, and so we, we gathered at these tables sitting right next to me is Lonnie. I had not met him. I heard about this guy. I didn't even know his name, but I'd heard stories about the guy. And so he ends up uh, the first day on. This is kind of interesting. He, he's wearing a, uh, a cowboy outfit. The first day, I believe, is that day. And I, I'm going I call it the word outfit because it wasn't just a hat or just Western jeans. It was a whole shebang. He had it all. Oh yeah, I think he might have had spurs on already. I'm not positive, but I it was right up to that detail of the of the what he was wearing. Uh, the next day, okay, uh, he shows up. He's dressed like a um, I would say more like a green beret. He's got the beret, but it's there on his his apulet on his shoulder, and he's got the full on military look thing, and his, his pockets is frisbee. <laughs> and uh, I'm going. This guy is interesting. Was he just that eccentric? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It, it gets better. One more. The third day, he shows up dressed like a Vatican priest. <laughs> the Vatican priest, if you're not aware of it, they have buttons. There are no zippers, no anything else except buttons throughout their whole outfit. I don't know if there's a spiritual significance there, but it goes down to the ankle. The shoes have to be buttoned, the special shoes. He has the hat on, the black one with the fuzz on top. Pause for effect. <laughs> what, what, what is his motivation? Help me here. I, I said after the third one, I said, I, I said that, uh, you know, Lonnie, is that your, right, okay. I said, uh, you, you did this, you did this, you dressed like that. What, what's that all about? And he looks at me like I'm stupid, which is very possible. And he says, uh, because God told me to wear that. Which you can't argue with him. I don't know what to say. Yeah. Right, right. He got my attention, certainly. And I told that story more than once, but uh uh, it, it's kind of kind of mystical and yet cool at the same time that the guy was like at a, at a yeah very childlike wow yes yeah wow. absolutely so I told me to. <laughs> what was he uh um i mean he'd inter what's what was engaging in conversation with him like that because i don't know some people have been tremendously gifted but they were mm -hmm. hard you know hard to talk to yeah uh, what was he like Rand, uh, Randy, he was, um, uh, I think, uh, depending on the setting, but I, he, he was uh, uh, very um, simple way to express himself. He tried to be as basic as possible. I think that's safe to say that. And uh, and he had some phonics problems, honestly. Having taught fourth grade elementary education yeah. background and college and so forth, I, I could tell. He had some reading issues, and, and sometimes I've seen him in, in Bible studies where he would have somebody else read the text. He had a, a paper clip or a uh, whatever it was, a some kind of piece of paper, and, and then he said, could you guys read that? And it, and it came across like including, but I, I knew enough that I really felt like it was way easier for somebody else to read than Lonnie. Wow. Because um, Lonnie, if you know his story a little bit, he pretty much was a dropout of high school. He was one of those socially promoted people where they – you know, you're taller now and you're an age older, we'll put you in the next grade. Right. Even though he never really got capable of, he never became capable of reading at a normal level for for what he was doing in life. And, mm. um, and so he, he, he really had a, a difficult time. He ran away from home by, or essentially and went to San Francisco where he came to the Lord. That's a whole different you know, track of talking about. But uh, uh, by the time that he was uh, at Chuck's house, he was brand new in the Lord brand new in a whole new way of thinking and living, uh, having come to Christ and, and being an evangelist mm -hmm. gigantically at the beginning. I remember you saying one time that, uh, you know, he would operate in the supernatural. They're just miracles. We just kind of almost like follow him around. And, and uh, you said something to the effect of, I, I wanted to get closer to that. And I just kind of tracked with him. What did that look mm -hmm. like? Did you, did you guys hang out? Did you just kind of follow him around? 
Yeah, I did. Uh, John Wimber said, you want to get good at a, a skill in ministry, if you can identify what it is specifically, he says, uh, like healing or moving in the spirit, getting words from the Lord, find somebody who's already doing it really effectively and fairly fluently and just hang around them. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, of all people, this guy, Lonnie, he probably has a hundred people asking him to do that. Maybe I could get in line. Well, I call him up and I said, Hey, John said, da, 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 da. He goes, I said, so can I be one of your people hanging out? And he goes, I've never heard this conversation with John, but for sure, you're the only one that's ever called me. Wow. <laughs> Randy, I'm thinking, you know, they don't realize this is an historic figure here in front of us. And, you know, he's not that much older than me. I had no idea he was going to die so quickly, you know, but, uh, but do you oh think my gosh, you know, in the, we, in the moment, you know, did they know he was that historic of a figure? That's the, something that always intrigues me is what do we understand about history in the, in the middle of it? Yeah, I, I, I think John probably did. And possibly a couple, three others. I, I think Ken Gullickson probably could tell that that was, he was probably a historic figure. Um, but yeah, it, it's an, it's a, an interesting thing. John Weber, he's another one. Yeah, I would say he's an honest to Pete historic figure. Yeah. You know, he was, can I tell you a weird John, John story? A ricochet of this, he, he was speaking in England at Holy Trinity Brompton yeah. and uh, HTB as they call it. And uh, during the break or there's people being prayed for, a guy walks up to John and he said it wasn't very well lit. So he didn't have, you know, all of his senses going on at once. But the guy says, can you sign my Bible? And he says, uh, well, I guess it's a little bit embarrassing. I've had people ask me the same thing. And he says, sign it right here. And he puts his finger on the page. John looks at it. And above the line there was Martin Luther, Charles Wesley, John Wesley. Uh, I mean, are you with me here? The yeah. guy, uh, William, uh, da, 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 the guy that started the Salvation Army in London, uh, his name was on there having set, signed it. And it, John signs it going, this is really odd. Yeah. And he shuts the thing, gives it back to the guy. And the guy says, you're next. Wow. Boom, where's the hi-hat when you need it? Yeah. And John, of course, has died. I think John's influence is perhaps bigger now than it was when he was alive, theologically, anyway. Yeah, I think and that's the, true. The vineyard movement. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the second and third generation have taken his ideas and propagated them further than one person could. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that, that's true. I, I think even at higher levels of uh, theologians are saying, you know, there isn't just a a power message or a word of God message. But in fact, here's another Lonnieism. He says, on one end of the spectrum, you dry up with the word, the word, the word. At the other end, you blow up with the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. Yeah. But if you can take the word and the spirit and marry them together, in the middle, they, they grow up. Yeah. So, so what was it like? Yeah. Like, what did what did your official Lonnie Frisbee internship? Like, did you get a t-shirt with a badge or did you have to wear an yeah. outfit every day or what? <laughs> I, I Not that far down the, the list, but... But, you know, we, we had some fascinating things happen. Uh, I, Lonnie's favorite restaurant is uh, was Denny's. And uh, as he told the stories, he goes, I would just hitch up hiking up and down the five freeway, in, or the 101 rather, in, in uh, California, lead people of Christ. They drop me off the next Denny's. And then I would get on with another person, lead them to Christ, and get on another Denny's going south. But uh he, he loved those, uh, for whatever reason, pancake a combination or whatever it was. But uh, we're sitting there the first night that I, I was out there just hanging around with them, hanging around with them. And uh, as we were sitting there, this guy behind us, now get this, Randy, he began to arch his back. Some people watching this might be going, this is getting kind of weird here. Well, that's sometimes what happens when God shows up. And uh, from his heels to his head, he was bowed, like, if you will, like this. He should have been like this. It was bowing, bowing forward. The guy was being touched by something was happening. And I think it was a lot of darkness that God wanted to, to, to deal with and, and the guy. And I said, look, should we go pray for the guy? Uh, Ronnie? And he says, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I go, why is that? He goes, because what will happen is that God will probably zap the guy. Then the police will show up because people are concerned. <laughs> I go, really? And he goes, that has happened to me until time and again, until I learned my lesson about not praying in Denny's. <laughs> we, uh, we, of course, are good friends with uh, Lou Engle. And yeah. um, Lou, when he prays or talks or gets excited, is a rocker. And he just rocks. Oh. And oh. He, he, uh, 
he also is a mad aficionado of donuts. If he's not fasting, he's probably eating donuts. And he, he was <laughs> in Pasadena, uh, I think at Poncho's Donuts. And he's um, early in the morning, he's sitting in his van and he's having his prayer time and eating his donut. And uh, all of a sudden there's a knock on the window and it's a uh, Pasadena police department. Someone has called and said, there's someone having a seizure in the van. <laughs> and uh, he had to explain, no, I, I'm, I'm not having a seizure. I'm, I'm actually quite fine. But so, yeah, you got to be careful where you unleash things. You could end up, oh, end up uh, summoning the authorities. Yeah, that is funny. funny. He, he, he said the very first time that happened, he was sitting in a, at a den. He said, yeah, he saw a guy walk into the men's restroom and he's wearing a neck brace ready. And uh, he goes, I'm going to go pray for that guy. And he, again, he's 19, the kid, I don't know who was in there. It turns out he's a dishwasher and he did not speak English, mm -hmm. though. He said that didn't stop me. I went ahead to explain the whole thing. I am a man of God. <laughs> you're 19, 19. OK, man of God. OK. And he says, I'm going to pray for you and you're going to be healed. And uh, there's more there, but I'll just skip over to it. He, he says he prayed for the guy and he uh, put his hand on his head and gave him a teeny little push. And this is the teeny one, he said. Teeny and the guy one. fell on the floor screaming and writhing in pain. <laughs> I don't know what he's yelling in Spanish, but he goes out the door. And I go, what do you do then? He goes, I put a 20 on the table and split before the police showed up. <laughs> There's a fine line between prayer and assault. That's right. Yeah. That Especially would be when, the, when the other one doesn't speak, speak English. So, <laughs> you know, okay, here we are. Uh, you know, these things are happening around him. Like this really... Uh, supernatural realm, people being delivered, miracles. What's uh, what's in the in the in the wake of that? I mean, the, what what was the uh, eventual outcome of a lot of that? Um, well, he was traveling a lot. Um, I, you know, I, I know the story going back to the very very beginning of, of his story. He, he was married at one point, quite young. Um, met his wife on the, the beach. Um, he was out doing evangelism, and uh, I don't know what happened there, if he led her to the Lord or whatever it was. But uh, then he, I, I think in the middle of traveling, that Lonnie um, got into some weird stuff, uh, that his, his uh, weak link in his chain was exposed. Mm -hmm. And uh, as having traveled a lot myself, as you have, Randy, I it's really not smart to travel by yourself. I yeah. know it's very lonely. It's uh, it's you can't process things very well by yourself. And and so he was doing probably too much of that. And I think he was vulnerable. And, and along the way, um, uh, his sexual brokenness from a child was um, made him vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, but I do know that later on to, to call Lonnie a, a homosexual is incorrect. Lonnie was, I would say, more technically a bisexual. Uh, he was married, of course. Um, when I was hanging out with Lonnie, he was engaged to a friend of Janie's and mine, mm -hmm. who is a uh, you know bona fide, pretty together person, who is a therapist actually. Which does not mean you're a together person <laughs> a therapist at all. I know that from experience too. But uh, at the same time, I, I believe that uh, uh, she saw in Lonnie something that a lot of people didn't see, mm -hmm. and uh, she's a ther again a therapist, you know, uh, yeah, and, and a together one, yeah. What would be, uh, just kind of as we wrap up here, a couple of takeaways mm -hmm. maybe that you had from your time with Lonnie that helped kind of shape how you did ministry? Boy, oh boy. Uh, you know, with Lonnie, it, it's uh, maybe I'm being out there a little too far with the intuitive of, of things, but when I was around Lonnie, I picked up that he was a pretty broken person mm -hmm. uh, from the get-go. And, um, and not that anything untoward was happening necessarily, but I, I knew I could pick up on his story enough. And uh, his, uh, he had a lot of stories about his mom. Uh, and she was a uh, Church of Christ lady. Mm -hmm. And she didn't really appreciate him being involved with the, the power of the Spirit very much. <laughs> yeah. And he was even praying one day in his at their trailer where they lived. And he's praying in tongues out loud. She could hear him. She goes, Lonnie, are you, are you praying in those? Uh, she cussed a little bit. Uh, tongues? And he said, no, Mother. I'm practicing glossolalia. She goes, oh, well, in that case, you know, she, Church of Christ, lady. God bless her. You know, she loved the Lord, I'm sure. But uh, you know what, what What has happened to me, though, Randy, is I, I think that from hanging with, with Lonnie, is there was something that was implanted in me just by, and again, we were not best friends. We knew other by name, et cetera. And there's a lot more Lonnie stories there. But at the same time, um, I, I began to 
to, to pick up on, this is really the, the kingdom here, mm -hmm. the, the broken, the rejected, the abused, uh, on and on. Uh, Lonnie was a, an archetype. You know, he was the, the lead hobbit <laughs> Yeah, in, in the sense that the one you would never, ever expect to be the big influence was, yeah. was Lonnie. And, and I, I think the movie did that well uh, about appreciating Lonnie and his role in the whole thing, in spite of his brokenness. And now that you say that, I can actually see that in um, in how you walked out ministry for years. And we've been around, been together for a long time. And uh, how you're consistently drawn mm -hmm. to those that maybe would others wouldn't be drawn to. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, honestly, I just be quite honest, I'm a, I've been a benefactor of that. When, when we moved to Cincinnati, we were church planters. We had, you know, we didn't have a, two clues to rub together. And uh, I think the vineyard was, you know, maybe about 6,000 people. And uh, you made time for me. And we used to hang out all the time. And, and people would go, wow, it's amazing. He's got time for you. And I thought, well, yeah, that is kind of amazing. But you, you kind of made a life of collecting folks that maybe other people wouldn't have collected. And I remember you telling a story about going through a drive through one time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a Taco Bell. Yeah. Uh, was, can, can tell that story. Cause I think that, honestly, that might be some of the, um, some of the payday from learning from Lonnie. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree, Randy. Uh, it was a Monday after, uh, you know, more than a half a dozen <laughs> Face it, that according to Carl George from Fuller Seminary, we had more, by far, more life services uh, at a Protestant church in America than any other church that he he was positive we had way more than anybody else. And so at the end of the weekend, you're kind of tired. <laughs> Twice on Saturday, we had seven, I think, at that time, five on Sunday. That's, that's a lot of talking. Uh, I'm burned out. I'm saying, Janie, I need to drive around and think for a little bit. I, I'm feeling like maybe I'm not even called to ministry. I'm, it's so frustrating. Nobody's changing. da da da, da. And uh, she goes, well, just go drive around. As I'm driving, Janie calls me. <laughs> Could you get me a uh, seven-layer burrito from Taco Bell? Yeah, it, you <laughs> I, know, I know you're having a crisis, but I need some calories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially that one because guacamole in it. Right. But uh, it ends up that uh, I, I pull in. Uh, they were training, um, well, apparently, a, a very uh, slow day with the, the line going through. I No kidding, Randy. I, I sat in the line for at least 10 minutes. And I'm trying to figure out, could I... I don't have a four-wheel drive. I have a little Honda something. I can probably go over that curb with that tearing out the entire undergirding. But anyway, I, I, I was stuck in there, could not get off because of the curb. Uh, I'm sitting there barely moving forward. After 10 minutes, the Lord speaks to me. I hear it clear as a bell. Open the door. I'll give you a gift. I thought, that is so weird. What the heck? I'm sitting there as I'm contemplating it. The, the line goes forward. And I thought, well, you know, praise the Lord. I don't have to worry about that weirdness, you know. Well, he says it again to me, open the door, I'll give you a gift. I thought, what the, what's what I have to lose? Open it up, look down there, there's a piece of gum that's been run over, I don't know how many times it had been black topped over, put it that way. And uh, as I look more carefully, I realized that is a penny. It's a discarded penny, but it's a penny that, and it hit me, you know, not many are willing, uh, perhaps, and perhaps I would not have been either if I wasn't sitting real low to the ground, didn't have to even bend over. Not many are willing to bend over to risk hurting themselves or wasting their time on a discarded penny. It's not worth it. And as I pry it up out of the ground, and by the way, it just didn't come up to the whole, you know, a, a clod of asphalt. And I've apologized more than once to Taco Bell for that uh, drawing chuck hole in their parking lot. But I, 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 as I was looking at it, I felt like the Lord clear as a bell spoke to me. And he said, I've given you favor with discarded pennies. And, you know, Lonnie was a discarded penny big mm -hmm. time. I, I would have to say that that it sounds harsh, but I don't mean it that way whatsoever. Uh, he was one that uh, God saw incredible value and potential in, and yet not many others did. And, uh, you know, the, the funny thing is, is uh, I have since then been in so many places, Randy, where I was so convinced I was wasting my time. Nothing is happening. God is not up to work. And yet I felt called to do it and to yeah. go there, whatever the case was. And yet, uh, it had, in the end, when it was all said and done, he, he, he continues to say to me, I've given you the gift of collecting pennies. And, and by the way, you can become a billionaire if you have no pennies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, that's been my boast. And I still absolutely feel that way. Uh, going out, you know, at least once a week and giving out stuff to the 
the, the people on the street that are homeless. But and I think something happens there to me. I get renewed. The, the Lonnie factor, the whatever you want to call it, kicks in again every time you meet somebody like that. Yeah. On the street. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, we look forward to connecting again, um, talking about some of these other things. Appreciate your perspective. Uh, what's on your day? It's early in California. What are you going to do the rest of the day? It's barely dawn. No, it's mid-morning. But uh, yeah, I'm finishing a book, Randy. It's um, I don't mind telling the name of the book. It's uh, Unleashing Kindness. And the subtitle is 101 um, Simply Profound Ways to Change Your Community. So very I'm cool. finishing it up toward the very end. <laughs> I could see the runway. <laughs> very cool. Well, I am uh, going to try and get all my kids in order here. Uh, they're home from school today and uh, get a few things done. Um, so we're going to jump off. But uh, thank you, Steve. Again, we'll talk again soon about some of these other topics because a lot of, lot of stuff Randy. to cover. Take care. God bless, man.